Right. Well, welcome everyone to the, the SMI lunchtime webinar. I acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the land on which we meet today. On behalf of the Sustainable Minerals Institute, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. Today's presentation titled Cultural Heritage Management in the Resource Sector, Establishing Good Practice Approaches is presented by Dr. Sarah Holcomb, Senior Research Fellow, Fellow in SMI's Center for Social Responsibility in Mining. Sarah is a social anthropologist with over 20 years experience in applied and academic research with Aboriginal Australians. She has published widely on a diverse range of issues, including indigenous human rights and challenges to implementation, extractive industries and sustainable development and Aboriginal community governance. Sarah's engagement in cultural heritage management is as a practitioner and an independent consultant for industry and benchmarking um, cultural heritage management systems and practices. You'll be aware, no doubt, of the major loss of cultural heritage at Dukin Gorge in Pilbara a couple of weeks ago, when two indigenous caves dating back 46,000 years were destroyed. So today's presentation is especially timing. As many of you will be aware, there is a review underway to find out what happened at the site and it won't be appropriate for us to comment on the specifics of the incident until the review and investigation process has finished. As ever, we welcome your questions, but I do ask that they are related to Sarah's presentation and not to the incident at Duke and Gorge. As per the other webinars, the Q&A button is at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to submit your questions at any stage during the presentation. And at the end of the presentation, I will then present your questions to Sarah. Um, I would like, like to hand over to Sarah and, um, and thank you for, for the webinar today. Sarah, it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Okay, um, before I launch into this seminar, I might situate cultural heritage management as a value proposition within the broader context of a mining operation and its business practice. <clears throat> Respect for cultural heritage is particularly important where resource extraction occurs in the, on the territories of traditional land connected peoples, notably indigenous peoples, where there are prior long-term residents in the region of the mine and where cultural rights are protected by law. IFC Performance Standard 8, Cultural Heritage, supports a consistent standard approach, regardless of whether or not the cultural heritage has been legally protected or previously disturbed. Respecting, actually, I might have to move this across the side because I can't see all my slides. Can somebody help me do this? Because I've got all um, people on the screen with me here. Okay, so maybe someone can do that while I'm still talking. Um, yeah, only cultural... you can see that, Sarah. Nobody else can see that. So. Oh, okay. I'm going to have to minimize <laughs> it's that. It's perfectly thing. clear for us. <laughs> okay, is it? Okay, hide thumbnail. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, so respecting cultural heritage can contribute to sustainable development outcomes, supporting a reconciliation action plan in the Australian context, gaining and maintaining a community acceptance of the operation, efficiency of operations, and enhanced legacy and reputation of the mining company. The key points I'm going to be elaborating on in this, in this seminar are that developing a cultural heritage management plan is not an add-on, but an essential component of an operation and begins at the social impact assessment stage. The tube needs to be integrated into the operation and updated like any other active component of the local operation. Respecting the prior rights and interests of Indigenous peoples is sound business practice. A compliance-driven approach is not likely to meet the expectations and aspirations of Indigenous cultural heritage custodians. Recognition that a group's identity is usually tied to their cultural heritage is essential. Many of you will be familiar with this map of Indigenous Australia, published by the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. The colours indicate different language groups. For the purposes of this seminar, the map provides a snapshot of the complexity and diversity of Indigenous groups across the country. Whether the customary land tenure of these language groups is formally recognised or not, 
This map is indicative of the tapestry of Indigenous prior rights and interests across Australia. For those interested in further detail, a link to the map will be in the online version of this seminar. What is cultural heritage? It's any aspect of a community's past and present that it holds to be important and pass on to future generations. It's usually grouped as the tangible, stones and bones, and the intangible, knowledge, practices and traditions. The term stones and bones is used here advisedly, as this archaeological aspect of tangible cultural heritage is often the focus of CHM efforts, rather than one element of many. As a group's identity is tied to their cultural heritage, managing this aspect of a company's operation is often one of the more complex areas, as deep emotions and attachments accrue to places. The idea that culture is a verb, not a noun, also applies to the meanings given to a tangible and immovable culture by oral cultural traditions. Types of cultural heritage places, objects and practices. Cultural heritage includes a really diverse range of, of objects, um, places and practices. Places include archeological features, historical cities and urban landscapes. Uh, cultural heritage ob objects include movable material culture, such as paintings and stone tools. Cultural practices include oral traditions, language and traditional medicines. Then my focus today is on Indigenous cultural heritage, and this is the most common area of focus for the resources sector in Australia. CHM, of course, also includes other cultural heritage that may be impacted by an operation. So in Indigenous Australia, common cultural heritage places and objects include um, tangible heritage such as artefacts, scatters, scarred or modified parts of the landscape, trees and rocks, a campsite or fireplace and a burial site. Intangible heritage includes sites associated with the dreaming or jukurpa as it's, as it's um, termed in Central Australia in many language groups and ancestors of places that hold religious or spiritual meanings and contemporary ceremonial sites, a site associated with historical events, which can be good or bad, and a site associated with something of value, such as bountiful hunting, seasonal produce, and so on. And on the right there, you can see an artifact scatter. It looks like a GPS um, in the middle of it. So material culture and occupation sites, such as tangible sites, or which are tangible sites, have tended to be the focus of heritage legislation and are those sites that non-Indigenous people most often recognise and value. Intangible sites that hold spiritual value are often far less recognised or understood and consequently less valued by most heritage laws and non-Indigenous Australians. This issue has been referred to as a value gap, where only a fraction of Indigenous Australia's place-based heritage is formally recognised and protected. Nonetheless, all of these places and objects will or may have intangible knowledge and or practices associated with them. And while there will be a spectrum or a range of importance and significance attached to different places, who decides what is significant, an external export, expert or the Indigenous custodians, is likely to be reflected in the size of this value gap. And as culture is a verb, not a noun, as mentioned, the significance of sites for custodians can change both within the Indigenous polity and outside of it, including in interactions with the resources sector. Cultural knowledge is not only the basis of identity for many Indigenous groups, but also a political resource. Cultural heritage management is the systematic process by which an operation accounts for the cultural heritage features and values within an operations area of influence, and then acts to reduce damage and or protect and enhance these features or values. Cultural practices, beliefs and traditions associated with places and objects and, the pract and practices are always changing as mentioned. Mining activities can contribute to and accelerate these changes both directly and indirectly. And um, I'll provide a brief example here. So a mining operation has built a road that destroyed a stand of trees that was sacred to a local indigenous group. This is a direct impact. The road into the region for this long life mine also enabled more ready access to and from local indigenous communities, putting pressure on the local language and intergenerational knowledge transfer as more young people started moving out of the area to larger towns. So that's an indirect impact. So both of these would need to be accounted for. Um, 
So CHM is a core activity in social performance management systems. Um, CHM planning is relevant to all stages of an operation's life. An additional set of CHM planning and activities applies when working with Indigenous peoples to balance their interests with the proposed development. Though there are usually specific regulations in different jurisdictions that must be followed as a minimum, a good practice standard and consistent approach across all operations is preferable. Principally because, with the possible exception of the Northern Territory, cultural heritage legislation across Australia has largely failed to support or protect Indigenous heritage. Having an understanding of the intangible cultural values of the community and how these can be promoted and strengthened provides an opportunity for inclusive engagement and social risk management. Methods for defining a site. The approach taken to defining a cultural heritage site will have an impact on the level of protection and also impact the levels of access that customary site holders or landowners will have to the site. A good practice cultural heritage management system should have the capacity to equally address both intangible and tangible cultural heritage and recognise and act on this issue of site definition and subsequent management. Are those experts engaged by the company defining sites as discrete focal points or as interconnected places within the landscape? To some degree, the approach adopted, perhaps a mixture of both, depends on the type of site and the expertise drawn on and to what extent the views of Indigenous custodians are enabled to inform or determine the site's significance. Adopting a values-driven approach contextualises a site as a place in a wider area rather than an isolated dot on the landscape. A values-driven approach caters to not only the need to enable Indigenous people to maintain customary attachments, but also their responsibilities for their land. To quote anthropologist Debbie Bird Rose, people talk about country in the same way they, talk, they would talk about a person. They speak to country, sing to country, visit country, worry about country, feel sorry for country and long for country. People say that country knows, hears, smells, takes notice, takes care, is sorry or happy. Country is a living entity. Sites as discrete focal points, or as interconnected. Now let me just see where I am. These lines of interconnection can reflect the movements of custodians in access to and between these sites and or the movements of ancestors from the Jogorba. In popular terms, these dreaming tracks are often referred to as song lines. This image could also represent a site constellation of a particular Jokorba ancestor who travelled across the landscape, creating particular features. The point here is that this approach, recognising interconnection, is more in tune with an Indigenous understanding of the landscape as sentient, as movements across it, underneath it or over it, were all essential in its creation. On the other hand, the approach that defines sites as a discrete feature, the singular dot demarcated on a map, is the most readily adopted for developments which, if sites are protected, would proceed between the sites. And Indigenous custodians will often have to accommodate this approach, but this is not ideal and compromises have to be reached. The scale of the project and the density of the sites will also impact the approach taken. This photo has been drawn from the internet, so apologies for the lack of potential IP attribution. Sister stock photo, as you can see. It illustrates the cultural logic of interconnection between places as the roundels refer to camps, sites or places of significance to the artist. The point here is that they're never isolated. Okay, now onto some nuts and bolts of developing a cultural heritage management plan or CHIMP as they're often referred to. There are a range of approaches to good practice CHIMP development. Um, the approach outlined here draws from the plan, do, check, act cycle, or the PDCA cycle, often used in social impact assessment. Each stage of the CHIMP's development is underpinned by inclusive engagement as good practice. Phase one is plan, which involves developing a baseline of cultural heritage, identifying or associated or impacted communities, identifying tangible and intangible cultural heritage, legal and regulatory requirements, 
the broader development and socio-political context. Phase two is do, which is implementing and integrating the CHIMP across the operations, procedures and systems. Phase three is check, which involves developing targets and indicators to measure activity and performance, monitoring direct and indirect impacts, ensuring significant impacts are reported, and evaluating the impacts, whether they're positive or negative. Phase four is act, which means reporting both internally and externally, so good communication needed, reviewing, updating, and improving. There should be an overarching chimp for the operation, while specific chimps should also be prepared for each stage of mine life. Okay, so each chimp, oh, sorry. So how does a chimp fit into a social performance management system? The chimp needs to be integrated into the operations and, and procedures and systems to avoid it being siloed. To be effective, it needs to be understood as an integral component of the social and environmental impact assessments. A clear procedure for the identification, evaluation and management of the operation's cultural heritage has to be developed. All potential users, including geologists project and pl project planners, should be trained in CHM requirements. A ground disturbance permit system, a cultural heritage zoning plan, and access arrangements for Aboriginal custodians should all be established. An overview of the operation CH in employment inductions should also be standard. <clears throat> okay, cultural heritage management is often embedded in local agreements negotiated under the Native Title Act. Agreement commitments also need to be cross-referenced in the CHIMP. So CHM could be part of cultural heritage agreements, the environment agreements, or community consent agreements. For Aboriginal people, the right to negotiate under the Native Title Act does not equate to a right to protect sites. Heritage protection is not a Native Title right. By this I mean that the right to negotiate does not allow Aboriginal people to stop a development they believe may damage cultural heritage. The question of how the balance is struck between managed destruction and protection is a core issue in negotiating a chimp as part of an agreement. According to Kieran O'Farclay, the strength of terms that are negotiated for CHM protection is closely related to how effective their negotiation team is and the way in which the power differential is managed between the company and between the Aboriginal group. Some agreements have weak CHM protection, others very strong protection. The strongest being where there is an unqualified requirement to avoid damage and where Indigenous custodians define the terms of cultural heritage significance, i.e. not solely an outside expert or the state. <clears throat> Agreements may contain a program of cultural heritage clearance operations within time limits, the establishment of a specific cultural heritage community liaison group that meets at regular times, minimum numbers of local heritage custodians to, to attend to the clearances, rates of remuneration for local expertise, expectations for the running of cultural awareness programs for new operations staff, cultural maintenance programs and resources, and cultural and protections for managing cultural knowledge, um, including Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. And this is a term from the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is now an accepted term. This issue of cumulative impacts is especially prominent in mining regions. Intensive activity can include roads, railways, ports, operational infrastructure, open cut mines, tailings dams, waste rock dumps, and so on. Maintaining living connections becomes an increasing, increasing challenge and necessity as, the ac as access to and movements on country constrict. Establishing a values-driven landscape level approach to site definition early on can assist in managing cumulative impacts more effectively. Such an approach recognises the ongoing need to ensure site and country access and the ongoing need to maintain attachment and manage responsibilities relating to caring for country. The issue of where the tipping point or threshold of encroachment is will have to be considered and discussed with the site's custodians 
as a site's or place's integrity is diminished by development. As certain sites are destroyed, then other sites will take on additional meaning. The painting on this slide is by Garua artist Jack Green, who lives um, in an outstation near Barulula, entitled Road Train Passing Through Sacred Sites. It speaks directly to this issue of encroachment. He painted it in relation to the MacArthur River mine in the Northern Territory. Okay, I'll just see how we're going for time. Okay. Um, limitations and diversity of heritage legislation. So this freely available edited volume, you can see the right to protect sites um, image, offers empirical perspectives about the operation and impacts of most of state and territory heritage laws. And I draw on this volume for the slide. There are at least 20 distinct Australian laws that deal in some way with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage. Many of them are substantially unaltered since the Native Title Act was introduced almost 30 years ago, including the Commonwealth Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act, 1984. This act established to provide protection of last resort, where a place of significance is under imminent threat, has been described as remarkably ineffective. Of the, of the 155 applications made under this act since 2007, 130 have been unsuccessful, the remaining 25 have yet to be resolved. This was from 20, 2016, that data. Likewise, since mid-2010, mining companies operating in Western Australia have applied 463 times under Section 18 of the Aboriginal Heritage Act for permission to destroy or disturb heritage sites, none of which has been refused. Australia-wide, there's only been one successful prosecution for desecration of a site. This was under the Aboriginal Sacred Sites Act, 1989, in the NT, in 2013. The mining company was convicted of one count of desecrating a site and one count of contravening an authority certificate. They were fined 120,000 and 30,000, respectively. It's widely recognised that Indigenous, sorry, widely recognised by Indigenous groups and independent experts that these laws, possibly excepting the NT, do not serve Indigenous interests. As a result, the good practice chimp does not fall back to a compliance model. Increasingly, this does not meet the expectations of Indigenous groups and civil society. Okay, so, um, and this is my final slide. I've just got some other um, reference slides at the end, but um, I'm just gonna, provide a brief overview, very brief overview of some comparatives between these two acts. Okay. In the Northern Territory Aboriginal Sacred Sites Act, the requirement for Aboriginal people to be consulted about impacts to their cultural heritage and in making decisions about their cultural heritage is integral. It's an essential part of the act, as you can see in several sections of the act drawn out here. The key point to make is that the NT Act was established at the height of the self-determination era and Aboriginal people's rights and interests and knowledge are actively recognised as necessary in protecting their heritage as a living tradition. So consultation with them is an integral part of the Act and its role in protecting sites has generally been effective. Um, although there are other instances other than that, um, that desecration I just mentioned. Uh, the NT Minister has never stepped in and overturned a ruling of the authority. In contrast, there's no role for Aboriginal people in the Western Australian Heritage Act. There's no requirement to consult with them under the Act. It's outside experts and potentially, but not necessarily Aboriginal people, appointed by the Minister on the Aboriginal Cultural Materials Committee, the ACMC, um, who make the decisions. While the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, who also happens to be the Finance Minister, is the final decision maker on behalf of the community. Likewise, the Aboriginal Cultural Materials Committee makes their decisions on behalf of the community, which is the mainstream population. Also in relation to the, um, the Aboriginal Sacred Sites Act, <clears throat> um, they have a right of appeal. There is a, a section 30, there's a review procedure. So it incorporates a right of appeal for both custodians and developers. In contrast, under the WA Heritage Act, 
um, there's no right of appeal for custodians, only for developers. Okay, likewise, the focus of, of this Act, the AWA Heritage Act, is on tangible cultural heritage as relics to be evaluated as significant or otherwise by scientists. Because there's no requirement to consult Indigenous interests, their values and attachments are, are not directly taken into account. So this comparative could continue. However, for those of you who are interested, a table with further detail about this comparative um, will be the online version of this seminar. Okay, so finally, I'll leave you with these two slides of um, international standards <clears throat> and references. So there's a huge amount of um, reference material available out there. Um, and this one. Okay, so thank you. Now I'll hand over to Neville, who will be creating the questions. All right, Sarah, th thank you very, very much. Um, just, to, just to let everybody know, please use the Q&A button and not the chat button. Um, it's very difficult for me to curate between the two. So if you do have a, a comment or a question, please put it into the Q&A button. Um, we have one question, which we'll, we'll start with. So you've got a little bit of time just to, to think of your question and put it in. So um, Sarah, the first question um, popped in during the talk where you were having a chat around um, compensation for loss of cultural heritage. And the question is, what are some mitigation slash compensation measures seeing as best practice to compensate for the loss of cultural heritage? Of course, when avoidance is not possible. Um, I have heard of this concept called cultural offsets. Um, and I don't know much about it or whether in fact it's used as a routine. But I guess the issue is that when one site um, is diminished or lost, then there has to be, hopefully, um, a way in which to um, garner or, you know, gain some ground in another area. So it really, it's fundamentally about engaging with Indigenous interests here and asking them um, how um, this, yeah, the desecration or diminishment of a site can be effectively it can't be, you can never get a site back, of course, but, but how you can manage that. So there are ways of doing that. Issues around compensation are diabolically complicated, um, but there are precedents um, in relation actually to the Timber Creek native title claim. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a complicated question and it's a, in some ways it's a legal question, but it's also a question that, that um, Indigenous people themselves would have to be actively engaged with. Right, thank you, Sarah. You've got a great presentation. How to identify the significance ranking of cultural heritage, CHs, if the time, money and other resources are limited? Yes, well, clearly, again, um, you do need expertise. So it'd be potentially archaeological, anthropological, maybe paleontologists. So you need that external expertise. And, and there are criteria. I mean, ICOMOS the um, International Council on Monuments and Sites has a range of criteria. Different Heritage Acts has a range of criteria to measure significance. So that's a scientific approach. So you need to engage with that at the same time as also engaging directly with Indigenous peoples who have, um, you know, rights over those sites and actually are responsible for those sites. So again, it's a conversation with, with both groups. Not necessarily, oh, well, obviously the central group is definitely Indigenous peoples. Um, but yes, it's, it, from, their from their perception, it's subjective. Um, so from science's perception, it may be less subjective, but that's a moot point as well, of course, because that always historically shifts. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's complex. Um, mm -hmm. Sarah, um, could you talk about how gender intersects with CHM? and how to take account of gender for studies and engagement, and perhaps some of the challenges in this area. Yes, well, certainly in Aboriginal Australia, it's very gendered um, in terms of uh, different rights and responsibilities uh, for sites. Um, so taking into account of gender basically often means having a male and a female anthropologist um, or male and female archaeologist to work with different groups. Um, and it's very standard to have women's and men's sites, women's and men's business. Um, so that will absolutely help. Um, and also respecting the fact, and this is a really 
difficult ethical issue, but respecting the fact that not all knowledge is publicly available. And, um, and it can be really problematic for Aboriginal people to be forced to divulge information about places, whether it's gendered or just secret sacred or not. And that's often why places are only divulged at the last minute even, um, because they don't want to provide that sort of information because it's knowledge is power and, and not all Aboriginal people, there's hierarchies of knowledge within the Aboriginal community as to who has rights um, to talk about places, to speak for places and that sort of thing. So I guess for gender, it absolutely starts with recognising that there will be gender differences and they both need to be accounted for. Thank, thanks, Sarah. Um, so, so could you briefly explain how a songline is a cultural heritage site? Oh, I, yes, sure. So songlines, the concept of a songline is basically um, a ritualised incarnation of the dreaming. So uh, dreaming tracks are often remembered uh, through songs. So um, each element of a song, a stanza of a song, might be about a particular site. Um, so they're basically the instantiation of a, of a site, I suppose. Um, so that's why um, sites can be absolutely anything on a landscape because the, you know, this religion is an animus religion and during the creative epoch, uh, that's when the ancestors um, laid down the land, if you like. And so everything, I mean, obviously there's different levels of knowledge now and different areas about places. Um, but a song line is basically a way to memorise. It's like a, a library, a way to memorise um, places on the landscape. And so when you start losing that sort of level of ritual information, um, sometimes you begin to lose knowledge of the land. So I don't know if that has helped. No, I th thank you for that. And then the next one sort of, I think, builds on that one. It really talks, can you say a little bit more about intangible cultural heritage? Uh, sure. So I'm, as a social anthropologist, that's the main sort of heritage I deal with. Um, and for me, it's about attachment to land and how people um, basically live their rights and responsibilities in relation to their father's country and their mother's country. So the land tenure system, uh, which is, you know, anthropological jargon, the land tenure system for Aboriginal people will often be through their mother, through their father, it could be through their mother's mother and their father's father, depends where you're working across Australia. Um, but different rights and responsibilities are accorded um, to whether you take country through father or through mother. And if a site is damaged, as happened at the Butu Creek site, um, which I mentioned, which is the case, this, the successfully one case was a manganese iron or mine just near Tenny Creek, um, Unfortunately, when that site was desecrated, um, the people who had management responsibilities for that site through their mother, because they have to look after that place on behalf of the father's father people, so there's Kira and Kurungulu, Kurungulu is through the mother, um, Kira is through the father. Um, they, there was a lot of dispute in the community about that. So yeah, there are ramifications here. If responsibilities aren't enacted, then there'll be uh, ramifications. So the land tenure system is basically just a system of customary ownership um, and people are literally related to the land as a kinship system. So, um, and that operates differently across Australia, but land is literally your kin because they have the same name as you. That's how it will happen. And there's different ways of attachment there, whether you're born at a place, whether it's your mother's country and she was maybe born there, she holds the name for that place. There's a, a whole raft of different types of affiliations that Aboriginal people can have. And the desert land tenure system is really quite different to the coast and riverine system. So it's very variable across Australia. All right, um, the next question, I'll, I'll just see if I can catch the, the essence of the question. And it's really around what is the process that mining companies should follow to start their studies into a local community that is against mining or um, how should a company start working with a community that is opposed to mine? Um, well, I guess it depends if you're engaging with this concept of free prior informed consent. Um, and of course, it's 
to, to begin that process, you have to know who the custodians are of those places. Um, so those people who have the right to speak, sometimes that can be contested. It's not always clear cut. Um, but if, if you've already, if you, if you know who the, the landowners are and they're actively opposed to mining there, then I guess the question I'd ask is why would you go ahead? Um, because according to the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, people have the right to development and the right to consent and FPIC. So that's a bit of a tricky one. I guess you'd have to ask me a different type of question. <laughs> um, but if they're actively opposed to the mine, then I, I think it would be very hard to, to continue with that. All right, so, so Sarah, the next question, I'm not sure if it's really um, connected with your, with your webinar, but it's definitely something which and we could probably pick up and give a more detailed answer to, but I'll, I'll pass it on to you and then you can, you can see um, how you can connect it. So how can abandoned underground mines be considered a cultural heritage? Um, how can they be part of local development, knowing that these mines have caused a lot of damage to the population? Right, well, I guess it depends, because uh, cultural heritage isn't just indigenous cultural heritage, it's also industrial infrastructure can be cultural heritage too. It really does depend on, on um, the subjectivity attached to that place, like what people think about that place. Um, if it was an abandoned mine and there's major environmental impacts around acid mine drainage, for instance, um, and it's disregarded as a, a scar on the landscape and, and, uh, and there's been no responsibility for it, um, then re clearly remediating that site is a very important thing to do. Um, but but it, really, so it really depends on what condition the site has been left in or the, the industrial um, place has been left in. But um, there's uh, some great examples of um, repurposed mine sites um, where value has been found in abandonment. So it's, it really does depend a lot on what sort of environmental legacies have been left and if they can be managed is probably what I'd say to that question but not all is lost necessarily. I think it's a great question to, um, to connect with. If the person who posted that wouldn't mind dropping me an email, because I think it's a great question to connect into the, the CRC um, time, Transitions in Mining Economies, that um, mm. has recently been approved, and they're looking at these issues. And it would be really interesting just to pick up the conversation through that forum. So um, mm. the... Um, the guest from Morocco, if you could drop me a note, I'll connect you in with the team that's working on that. All right, and um, this one I think is absolutely close to your heart. So what's the best practice within industry at the moment in terms of cultural heritage training and awareness? Um, what are you seeing that works in terms of helping organisations, operations and everyone on site to understand all of this? Yeah, well, look, there's been a lot of critique, you know, about... Um, cultural awareness training and those sorts of things. So, I mean, really, I think it really is about leadership within the industry. Um, and it sort of has to sort of start from the top down in many ways. I mean, clearly, you know, there's a systematic approach here where all new staff will gain some sort of training. Um, but unless that training is also lived throughout all elements of the, you know, the company, then it doesn't necessarily count for much. Um, obviously, there's different standards and quality of training, and, and I would anticipate that Aboriginal people who are the landowners would have to be employed to deliver that training. Um, I mean, that would be part of um, a negotiated agreement, presumably. Um, but, you know, having said that, it's complicated. Um, so they would probably work in tandem um, you know, with another expert or several experts to help them de deliver up a package. But that would be an ongoing form of employment probably too, because um, all new staff, as I mentioned in the webinar, all new staff have to um, be exposed to cultural, what the cultural heritage management plan is and, uh, and what the value of local culture is that they, you know, in terms of the landscape and the land that they're working on. So it's an ongoing element, but it's also systematically has to be part of the, the company ethos as well. And, and Sarah, you've got a, an upcoming course that you're busy developing in this area, if that's correct? Yes, that's right. So um, 
Yeah, this sounds like a plug. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, so um, topical. We might just pick it up now. Well, well, it's it's unfortunate. It would have been great to have had this in person. So we're hoping that we can still do this on site, you know, on campus. Um, but it would just be a master's, um, so a short course, master's in cultural heritage management, like a good practice approach. Um, and ideally, we want it to be in person. That would be much much better. Um, but otherwise, it will have to be some sort of online. Um, offering, I think that's right. It would just be like a three day course, I expect, something like that. All right, fantastic. Thanks, Neville. Mm. Um, the, the other, the next question is really just how does the Queensland legislation compare to the Northern Territory legislation? Oh, look, I don't think I can answer that. I haven't worked in Queensland um, in any great de detail except sort of over on the western border near uh, the Northern Territory. Um, but what I can say, my understanding is that um, under the Native Title Act, it's increasingly the case that um, from what I've read, particularly from that Right to Protect Sites book, there's a, an article in there or chapter in there um, about Queensland, um, about the, an empirical chapter about how that operates um, in practice. And, um, and they have been critical of basically saying that the Native Title Act has, has sort of stepped up and people are negotiating their own um, heritage management plans, but in, in a way it's become privatised and not transparent and there's a massive amount of diversity between groups as to what sort of heritage protection they have um, managed to, to sort of gain for their own group. So unfortunately, really serious lack of consistency, but I don't know if Queensland, um, I, I don't think it is, I don't think it's um, as extreme as the Western Australian Act which as far as I'm aware is possibly the most limited act in, in Australia. And, um, and obviously the other thing in the Northern Territory, just as an aside, is that they've got the Aboriginal Land Rights Act. So that's the other reason, which offers inalienable freehold title and gives Aboriginal people the right of veto over development on their land. And so that's the other reason the Sacred Sites Act was really quite effective, I think, because they've got that comparative. Whereas obviously in Western Australia, there's, um, well, yeah, you've got the Native Title Act as well as you have in Queensland, but um, you've got the, there is a, a Land Act in Queensland, but it's nothing like the Aboriginal Land Rights Act. It's more historically based, not based around primary spiritual responsibility for people and intangibles. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, I can't answer your question more directly. Thanks. We, um, the next one is, um, what is best practice in terms of companies managing the cultural information that they collect mm. through their um, CHMPS. Their, their cultural heritage management plan, the CHIMPS. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Roger. I can see you've asked that one. Look, that's a really important question because um, a massive amount of tangible and intangible cultural heritage is now being managed by the resources sector, Australia wide. Um, they're holding on to them, they've got massive archives all these reports that are written by archaeologists and anthropologists um, that have to be written under various forms of legislation. Um, and, and currently there's no systematic approach to the management of this. And even in terms of, you know, providing these, um, you know, reports and data and objects and things back to Indigenous groups. So ideally, um, ideally local knowledge centres are developed at some level um, and there are some knowledge centres happening in the Northern Territory actually through the libraries program um, and I know in the Pilbara there's talk about um, living knowledge um, so I'm just checking in, in the Pilbara there's talk uh, in the borough um, of developing a, a, a living knowledge centre um, so that's ideal um, but I guess I guess what I would say if there's long, long life mines and, you know, um, very intensive, um, you know, rounds of cultural heritage um, uh, sites have been, you know, explored and there's a lot of data there, then clearly there has to be ways to manage that that have to be, um, you know, negotiated with Aboriginal interests. Because otherwise what happens when the mine folds or whatever <laughs> it closes at some point what happens to that data that's a really important question that has to be part of a cultural heritage management plan so data management 
has to be part of the plan. At the moment, um, yeah, it's just Roger to answer your question, <laughs> which is possibly hypothetical or rhetorical. Um, yes, it's there's no systematic approach. So you, you could there is definitely um, what you could develop as a as a good standard, um, but I can't answer that in a you know a short. Yeah, just a, a short moment here. But, you know, th there's certainly ways to develop that, but it has to be negotiated and consensual. All right, so we've got about four questions left and we've got about 10 minutes left before we need to wrap up. So we'll, we'll step through these. We probably um, won't be able to take many more after that, but it's, it's been fantastic receiving the questions. And if people would like to post them, we can try and answer them offline. So I'll just, I'll step through the last four. Um, presumably communities don't always agree on what actions are acceptable in terms of mitigation and acceptable development. How does one best deal with the fact that someone or some groups are likely to be unhappy with outcomes um, when others are happier? Um, mm. Is it the case that the loudest voice wins? Mm. Yeah, that's a really complicated question. Um, there is always diversity in communities. There's no doubt about that. There is no community of interest necessarily. Um, Inevitably, there'll be some groups who are really strongly opposed to development in the first instance, other groups who want those sorts of opportunities that come through, um, you know, engaging with the market economy. Um, so it is a really difficult question. And in some ways, it depends on um, to what extent you've engaged um, an anthropologist or some external person to some extent as well, who understands the political economy of that place and who has the rights to speak as opposed to other people, because it shouldn't always be the loudest voice. That's actually not what it's about. It should be about recognising people's customary rights and interests and allowing those um, to have serious input into how decisions are made. Um, having said that though, and I'm just cognizant of a, someone else down here has asked about a human rights based approach. Often um, women's voices may not um, gain much traction uh, or, the, or the voices of even, of, you know, young people. It might just be very senior males, you know, who are making the decision. So in some ways you have to cater for that as well. Um, yeah, so I think it's about balancing up these different rights and interests, um, getting some external input um, and also spending enough time, not rushing the process, but spending enough time to actually understand what the fallout is going to be to some extent about what sorts of decisions are made and mitigating impacts. Because often there's always a rush, rush time frame here, but you want to take a long view, I think, and give people enough information to make sure that they can mitigate the risks or they know what the outcome is going to be if they take certain paths. So I think you've picked up on one of the questions further down, which was around in your experience, how would you best manage the time frames? of an appropriate mm. engagement process and corporate project timeframes. Mm. Yeah, that's true. There's often a major conflict there. Um, and I think if you're genuine, if a company is genuine about trying to gain <clears throat> free prior informed consent, then you need to allow enough time. You definitely need to allow enough time for people to, um, to, to engage actively with the raft of changes over time frames and things like that, um, you know, what the sort of development's going to bring. Um, so I think that absolutely has to be catered for. I think um, the engineers, um, all of those people on the technical side, um, you know, of, of um, the industry, uh, this is why I'm saying a chimp has to be integrated um, into the project. So all of those others who ordinarily may not even think about this aspect of a, an operation, they have to be part of the discussion as well and recognising that maybe they have to put the, the brakes on a bit. If, if they want a long life mine that's not, that's going to actively engage community interests, and as I said, it's a, you know, cynically perhaps, but it's a risk management exercise, then they have to put the brakes on and go a bit more slowly, I would have thought, because it's a massive change for a local population if they've never been, particularly if they've never been exposed to mining before or resource extraction before. All right, and this one also leads on in a little way. In, in your opinion, 
which are the most effective heritage management tools once the operation has already started? So not in the environmental impact assessment stage. I don't know if there were tools as such. I mean, I think the main tool is probably having a very effective community relations team. So I think it's people who are, who are the main tools here. Um, so very much it's about inclusive engagement um, and always being available and making sure every step of the way that, um, that there's an understanding about what the impacts are going to be and how negotiable those impacts are. Um, so I think probably the most effective tools will be effective staff um, who are building relationships and trust, but, but not in an inauthentic way. I mean, you know, they, they have to, to some extent, also have the interests of, you know, the community at heart as well. Okay. Um, the next one is, and this is one you picked up on, perhaps you might say a little bit more about human rights impact assessment and where that sits in your gym? Um, I don't know if, if within Australia, my understanding is that um, we haven't really engaged with this idea of human rights based impact assessments here. Um, I know Mick Bainton did in Papua New Guinea um, and certainly in Australia we have Indigenous um, based impact assessments and Kieran O'Farkley has undertaken um, one of those at least that I know of in relation to um, the Kimberley region. Um, what I would say though is that um, I think there's a massive scope for that sort of approach to be adopted in Australia and that would be really exciting but you would have to marry it with an Indigenous based impact assessment and when I when I say when I talk about that approach um, I mean that Indigenous peoples themselves have to be leading this um, uh, it, it can't just be something where all the the idea of mitigating impacts comes from external sources. I mean, people living on their country know, um, you know, have to have the best answers themselves to these sorts of things. So that would be my approach, um, that you'd have to marry both um, human rights based and Indigenous impact assessments. And increasingly, I think there's call for <clears throat> Indigenous impact assessments to be undertaken. So they're, they're also independent is the point. In the, the company might pay for them, but they're independent and the Aboriginal group or Indigenous group would actually engage their own experts. Um, and also it's a skills um, development exercise for the community as well, because if they're done really well, they can be really fabulous baselines um, and they can be a great resource for the group, um, particularly in the Australian context, um, where um, you need, you know, effective, you need to know what the population is um, and you need to <clears throat> know what sort of service delivery is and those sorts of things to also access um, federal government support. And um, the census, the Australian census is notoriously bad in remote areas. And so these baselines offer a great opportunity to, to get some really solid data for communities to then advocate on their own. Um, for themselves in terms of greater resourcing and things like that. All right, Sarah, I'm going to jump down to a question on um, data sovereignty just to pick up on Peter's one, uh, Roger Barnes' one. So, Sarah, what about the concept of um, data sovereignty? This concept has become <clears throat> more prominent in recent times. Could you explain this in relation to CHM and how a company should understand that term? Yeah, very good question. Um, you're right, data sovereignty. And that also includes the census, what happens with the census data and who collects it. So basically, who asks the questions uh, are the ones who then const almost get to construct the answers and then what happens to the data. So this idea of data sovereignty basically means that um, Aboriginal people or Indigenous peoples themselves take control over their own information, their own knowledge and, and how to manage that information. So. I briefly mentioned this earlier um, in relation to the other question about what happens to all these reports, all these, uh, all this material culture that gets sort of swept up and put away in a cupboard or in a, you know, in a shed somewhere. Um, and I think this is an essential part of negotiating a plan, a cultural heritage management plan with a group, is to actually talk to them about, okay, um, what shall we do with the information that we get? What do you want us to do with this? Um, 
will it be part of the plan for us to develop a, um, a knowledge centre for you like as a data archive, a living knowledge centre, whatever it is. But I think that's, yeah, that this is, it's, it's a bit of a new field in many ways, which is completely outrageous. Um, but yeah, so, so da there's some great material online about data sovereignty too, but it's, it's just acknowledging that um, the way, I mean, this whole thing of um, knowledge management in indigenous um, knowledge economies is completely different. Just to go, going back to this idea of Google, you know, everyone knows Google where knowledge wants to be free, freely available. It's the opposite for indigenous knowledge. There you can only, you only have a right to access certain knowledge when you reach a right, the appropriate stage in life. You know, there's ritual levels and things like that it's about gender. So this, yeah, it's a very complex field, but there's quite a lot of information, you know, written about how to manage this, but it's a part of the early conversation, you know, in chip development. Right, so we need, we need to start wrapping up. We have got two mm -hmm. more questions. Um, what I'd like to do is pick up on the one which is looking at um, what are some key knowledge gaps in terms of research and literature around CHM? And is there enough literature slash case studies available? So I think I could even answer the last part of that, but um, you're the expert. Well, look, I think that's a good question. And actually, I don't think there is. Um, there's th this, that uh, edited volume, the right to protect sites is one of the few volumes um, because, because these agreements that are negotiated with Aboriginal groups are commercial and confidence agreements um, and the sort of work that gets undertaken on cultural heritage management across Australia, it's basically between the company and between Indigenous groups. So it's, it is effectively privatised and we actually don't know what's happening. It's, it's a major vacuum, as a matter of fact. Um, so there's, yeah, there's, there's absolutely not enough literature and case studies. So yeah, that, that's all I could uh, <laughs> respond to that question. Thank you. For and then the last question is probably the, the toughest one of all. Um, and I'm not sure that there is a right answer to this one. So I'd be interested in your views and your, your thoughts on this one and probably something which we can, we could take over for another, another seminar, but can you please elaborate on the value of cultural heritage training within companies if the company practices do not require best practice around cultural heritage, um, i.e. under current regulation. Um, an example here would be the recent Rio Tinto examples in WA. Yes, well, look, I mean, part of the issue, of course, is that you have these multinational mining companies who work in all these different jurisdictions and these different jurisdictions have different standards um, in place, you know, different legislative standards. Uh, and a call that, you know, it's a, it's a global call because this is the purpose of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And there's also a growing call in Australia. I mean, actually, it's been going for a decade where Aboriginal people want a consistent standard approach to heritage management Australia-wide. So, you know, those in the NT aren't just the lucky few, that, you know, all other groups have the same sorts of rights to manage their heritage in a way that meets um, ethical standards. So um, there's always an issue when, you know, you've got a company that works across all these jurisdictions, which is, you know, very common, and they do have different standards in particular jurisdictions. So what I'd say is that um, a company has to be consistent, actually, and so give consistent training to their staff. Uh, yeah, sorry, I probably have to leave it there. No, thanks, Sarah. And, uh, and I suppose my view is the more training that we can do, the greater the awareness, the greater the awareness, the greater the chance that we'll get change. Um, so I would, I'd be advocating for more training, not less. And with that in mind, just a reminder that um, we will be running a, um, an online course looking at cultural heritage. It's been busy being developed. So if you can keep an eye on our SMR website. Um, and it's just really, Sarah, thank you very, very much for your presentation and your time. I think we probably could add another couple more hours. And um, for those that have really, it's piqued your interest, please look out for the course. Um, just a reminder that um, we had a chat last week about moving the time slot. So we're going to do that from next week. We'll move from a nine to 10 o'clock um, next week, Tuesday. And next week, Tuesday, we'll have a so Associate Professor Mansur Draki, 
and he'll be presenting on mine closure and residual risk, a geochemical perspective. And it just leaves me to, to thank everybody. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks everyone for, for your time today. And I've really enjoyed just catching up with everyone. And um, these seminars are a really important part of our week. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Neville, for sharing. Okay.